time for questions. I've got a couple here on the um, on the platform. Um, Jeff, you're uh, lined up first. This is a question from uh, Giles. Uh, his question is, at what stage of ex exploration uh, would Perseus be interested in looking at new projects in Africa? So what do you consider, I suppose? And then as a follow-up question, do you see the Central African sub-region as a prospective investment zone in the future? Um, well, yep. Is it going? Yeah. It is. Oh, look, we're, we're involved in, at the very early stage of exploration, actually. I mean, um, we've, we've taken a very conscious decision in recent times to, uh, to pursue our growth through org organ organic growth means rather than acquisition. And so we, we've embarked on um, exploration, not only just in the immediate uh, vicinity of our existing infrastructure, but we're also looking at very early stage uh, exploration uh, in, in areas away from our established base. So, uh, you know, we believe we've got uh, significant capacity at, at all levels there. So uh, we'll be, uh, we're funding that very uh, significantly uh, in, in re, you know, coming times and uh, looking forward to some su success. As to uh, the question regarding Central Africa, to be perfectly frank, uh, I don't know anything about it. So uh, it's probably best for me not to make any comment at all. But, um, you know, our, our focus at the present time is very much in West Africa. Um, but having said that, we, we are willing to uh, to go into uh, further afield. I mean, but there's a fairly simple equation there. There needs to be a decent risk-reward return. You know, for going to countries where we don't know what we're doing, there needs to be a pretty attractive target to make it worth our while. Thanks, Chef. I'll point out that Giles is an exploration um, consultant, so I'm sure he may be able to consult you on, on Central Africa. Giles, I'm sure you can follow that up with Jeff. Um, I want to stay with you, Jeff. Uh, it's actually a question from myself. Um, political risk has, all, has, been a, has been a question that's loomed over this conference since 2003, and, and the political risk prof profiles of, of many jurisdictions in Africa. But this year, in particular, we've seen you, you know, disease and um, uncertainty, um, social unrest, um, you know, election disputes, and so forth. But putting aside the United States, What's happening in, in West Africa in, in particular? Is the political risk profile improved? And is the perception and the reality, is there, is there a big gap between them? Uh, look, <clears throat> you know, I think there is a big gap between perception and reality. I mean, it's like everything, isn't it? I mean, you have fear of the unknown. And I, I, I suspect that there are many uh, observers of, of Africa who don't understand or don't know too much about the way things work. And, and they are naturally uh, concerned about it. But I'm sorry, but we can't ignore the United States. I mean, um, you know, what's going on over there at the present time, uh, you know, is, is no different to what has occurred in, uh, in fact, actually in, in Cote d'Ivoire on the weekend. There was an election held on the 31st. And, um, you know, surprise, surprise, the people that lost the, um, the election said that it was rigged. Um, you know, I've kind of... <laughs> I heard that again this morning. So, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know that there's, there's terribly much difference. Look, the thing is this, I guess, is that, you know, in operating uh, as we do, we, we, we seek to understand things as best we can. I think we believe that, you know, there, there are lots of things that we never will understand and we do rely very carefully on, on our uh, local partners to, to educate us and to, to steer us, uh, you know, down an appropriate path. But as to, you know, is the risk any more or, or, or less, I, I honestly don't believe that it is any more or any less. You know, I, I say, um, you know, rather cynically from time to time, there have been fewer changes of leadership in either Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire than in Australia over the last five years. So uh, I'll leave, leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Dave, uh, I've got a question here for you. Um, on your graph, I say I've got it here, it's from me. Uh, on your graph, it looked like a huge tipping point in the last 18 months for, for um, mining operations using renewables. What created that tipping point? Was there, was there a key driver that, that created that scenario? Yeah, look, I think there's, there's a couple of factors. A certainty is one of them. Someone needed to take that first leap and, and companies like Sandfire and Goldfields took that first leap. And, and prove that it can work. And I think the fact that uh, De Grasse has now been running for four or five years, I think probably more, very successfully, the, the numbers are there, the performance is there. I think prior, prior to um, De Grasse getting solar, they were averaging about one power outage a year. Um, there hasn't been one for nearly two years. Or in the first two years of operation, there was, there was no power outages at all. So um, the performance and reliability of hybrids is proven. 
Um, but I think the biggest factor is, is uh, cost. Um, we're now significantly cheaper than thermal energy. Um, so I think that's, that's, it's not only now just an environmental thing, it's not about uh, the green side of it, it's about saving costs on an operation, improving reliability. And certainly it was a tipping point, I always say, last year was a watershed year for us, um, where all of a sudden there was just a massive cascade of, of projects coming through, and we're seeing that now with the Tier 1 mining companies as well. You see in the media that uh, Rio Tinto, FMG and BHP have all got massive renewable energy programs coming up. So, yeah, I think that's, that certainly was a tipping point last year. Does that price volatility in the fossil fuels, even though the you know, oil prices have dropped, does that actually, is that actually a benefit for, for renewables because it's got a consistent pricing? Yeah, we always look at renewables as a hedge on your fuel. It's, it's exactly what it is. It's fairly consistent, and the higher the percentage of renewables, the more consistent that pricing will be over the years. Peter, uh, you mentioned in your presentation a couple of uh, projects that you've been working on, and you mentioned the use of renewables and, and reducing um, carbon footprint, really. It, it, will that be the main innovation in, in mine design and mine uh, processing design over the next decade? How different will a mine look 10 years from now? Um, I think fuel uh, or energy um, for, the, for the mines will be one significant part of it. And we've, we have, from back in 2012, when we were working on concentrated solar power for the Tropicana mine at, um, at, um, for, for Anglo Gold Ashanti and Independence, um, that was our sort of first foray into that. Now CSP is, has been largely um, overtaken by sort of the traditional PV and the hybrid, uh, current hybrid solutions. And the beauty of it is that, as Dave said, that as those costs come down, it actually changes the complexion of not only the, the process plant and what you can do in a process plant and the like, but also changes potentially the complexion of the mine itself. So the cutoff grades, et, et cetera, because of your operating costs. But that's one innovation I think is going to um, be seen and felt pretty significantly in the next five years. I won't even say the next ten years. I think some of the other things that are, are occurring and, and needing to occur is upgrading your feed into the, the process plants. So, uh, you know, I know we're doing a lot of work out of our South African offices um, on, uh, on ore sorting, X-ray technology and the like, and a lot of that's come out of the diamond industry uh, and now being uh, used more broadly. Um, process optimization I touched on, um, that's going to be incredibly important. And mines like uh, the Uri mine, which is mill rock ready and is instrumented to be able to, to do that remote sort of, not only that remote control, if you like, but remote optimization, um, it's going to become more and more um, uh, a thing that uh, is just going to become commonplace. And the third thing is the big use of, of, of digitised data. And we are, I know we're spending a lot of time thinking about how we use, uh, or how we use digitised data, not only in, in delivering our services, but also in, you know, uh, enhancing, um, you know, the, a mineral processing facility or, in fact, a mine from, from pit to, to port. So it's those sorts of things I think you're going to see material changes in in the next short while. I think we have reached a tipping point in a lot of these things, I believe. Thanks, Peter. Jeff, can I ask you, uh, we often see the majors are leading the way in implementing these, these technological advances and, and innovations. How does Perseus approach its innovation strategy? Well, I guess, um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? And as I said in my presentation, I mean, a key part of what we do is, is seek to continuously improve. And... Um, Pete mentioned the mill rock thing that is in Yeori. I should say, actually, that mill rock has been been installed at Edicam for quite some time, and you know has been a uh, an important factor in in us being able to turn that operation around. So, you know, we don't sort of set out to be anything fabulous at all. We, what we do seek to do is to continuously improve. We look for opportunities where technology can be employed in a way that we can, uh, you know, execute it successfully. We do it. And, um, you know, I think the things that Peter was mentioning there, you know, the innovations that are coming down the turnpike, I absolutely agree. There's a lot of those that will, will be in play as part of mainstream within a very short period of time. And, and also the, the energy the renewable energy, energy space is one that uh, has changed dramatically as well. And, and you know, we, we for one would certainly be seeking to embrace that. I mean... Um, you know, when we looked at when we looked at it for our Edicam mine, which is only now you know, a few years, it was quite expensive, and we couldn't do it. If we were building that today, I dare say we would we would be running off um, solar or something of that nature. So it's changing very quickly. You need to be alert to it, and 
and, and, and take the opportunities as they present. Great. Thanks, Chef. We've got time for one question from the floor. Sorry, I stole most of them from myself. Did anybody have a question? Just up the front here, Christine. Thank you. Just coming on your right there, Anthony. Yeah, question for um, either of the two contractors here. Um, just wondering, um, in terms of South Africa and the energy situation and ESCOM and all that, whether you see, we talked about, essentially hint that renewables was kind of the way forward for um, what we see the country, but also do you see that as being a way forward for maybe rejuvenating the perception, investment sovereign risk or investment risk for South Africa uh, mining more broadly to maybe get some investment back into there? Look, I'm probably not the right person to talk about investment in Africa. I'm, uh, I'm just an EPC construction guy based in Perth. But um, certainly investment risk, from, from our perspective in renewables, investment risk is huge for the simple reason that we have a much longer payoff, payback period than we have in, in, uh, the, in the mining space. And some of our projects, in order to make them economically viable, we're looking at a five or six year payback. And uh, certainly, in, I'll talk about Australia for a moment. Australian drillers really only drill out four or five years. So it's very hard to get a, a renewable energy solution bankable uh, on four or five years. So that's a bit of a challenge for us. So certainly investment risk is, is significant in renewables and it's one of our biggest challenges. I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. It's a bit of a deviation. Yeah, well, just in terms of the, you know, the, the, the cost of mining and the reliability of uh, power needed for mining. You know, and you mentioned the ESCOM issue. Is, well, obviously that's important for miners, right? Because they need any, any power for the plants and that. Yeah, look... At the ESCOM issue, the, the challenge we have with renewables with ESCOM is the licensing issue. We couldn't do it before. Um, ESCOM, ESCOM prevented us from putting reliable sources on mines. That's changed now, and, and the, the landscape in, in South Africa, in mining especially, has changed dramatically in that now that we can put in sub-10 megawatt power plants uh, if we get the approval from NURSA. Um, and that's having a massive difference because you are getting back to 99.8% reliability, which mine, mine sites need. So it's certainly increasing uh, the, the, the reliability of a mine site, and it's a, it's a huge... It, it's the reason we see that massive spike coming through now, especially in South Africa, is that now we can start to get mine sites in Africa back to 24 hours operation in, in South yeah. Africa. And that's what I meant by uh, investment risk, I guess, in terms of for, for miners to be able to willing to go, oh, the powers now can be reliable because of st these kinds of solutions, so let's get back in there and invest in... Yeah, I think we've, we've actually, Anthony, it might be a great question for our final panel of the day, which is focused on the South African mining industry. So I reckon we can put that to them later on. Thanks very much. Well, we've run out of time for this uh, first half or first third of the session. So can you just join me in thanking our panellists, <laughs> Jeff, Dave and Peter.